get new clothes. You said that out loud, Kevin. I know, I have to get new clothes. They're too big. And they're all like starting to do that drapey thing. Yeah. It's a good one. Uh, maybe I was reading your thoughts. I just want to check everyone else here. <laughs> no, I, I didn't know if that thought went out of my head, but this microphone's so sensitive it can actually hear my thoughts. So yeah. be scared. I'm just, I'm just waiting for the guests to join us. Numbers are going up. Thank you for all of you. All right, we'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual briefing, Transforming the Transformers, Transforming organiza Organizational Decision-Making and Ways of Working, brought to you in partnership with Red Hat. My name is Serhis Devo, and I'm Director of Profile and Relationships at the trans Tasman Business Circle. For those listening from Australia, I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of the land and pay our respect to the elders, past, present, and future, for their whole memories, traditions, culture, and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Thank you to our panelists joining us for this session today. Anthony Watson, General Manager, Technology Operations, ENZ Bank and New Zealand. Amit Kumar, Director and Acting Head of Transport Engineering of this Australia. And Kevin Burr and Jeb Bloom, Global Senior Directors, Red Hat Global Transformation Office. I'll give you a quick snapshot about each before we head into the conversation, although you're not here to listen to me, so I'll try to be quick. With over 20 years of experience in technology, Anthony's passion is working with organizations to maximize, uh, maximize ROI from technology investment. He is currently leading enterprise domains New Zealand for ENZ Banking Group in New Zealand, leading a highly skilled and dedicated team of technology professionals. Amit is an experienced telecommunications leader with strong technical, commercial, and financial foundations across radio access networks, transmission, core IP networks, and operations. Amit is currently leading Optus Transport engineering team across mobile, enterprise, fixed business, and content. Bringing 30 plus years of technology and management experience, Kevin joined the Red Hat Global Transformation Office in 2019. Prior to Red Hat, he was a serial CIO and CTO in both public and private companies. He is also the author and co-author of six IT management books and is often looked to as a visionary in optimizing businesses to blend sustainable technological evolution with human learning and organizational improvement processes. With over 20 years of experience, Jabe excels in transforming the organizational dynamics of management, design, development, and operational practices. As part of Red Hat's Global Transformation Office, Jeb brings a unique perspective to multiple industry communities with provocative insights. He is currently creating his dissertation for a PhD in design studies at Carnegie Mellon University, focusing on the field of trans transition design. The discussion will be moderated by Paul Smith, IT editor at the Australian Financial Review. Thank you, as always, for joining us, Paul. The event is on the record. You can submit questions through the Q&A feature and have the option to avoid any that has been asked. Thank you so much to Red Hat for the thought leadership and being wonderful partners. I hope you enjoyed the briefing today and Paul, please get us started. Okay, thank you very much, Cerise, and thank you much, gentlemen, for, for being with me this morning as we, we kind of get used to these kind of dispersed <laughs> events where we're all together but alone. So I appreciate you all taking the time to have a chat. Um, as Cerise used the word transformation about three times in one sentence, you can guess that this is um, a conversation that's going to talk a lot about the practicalities of the idea of transformation and, and the actual people um, responsible for the transformations in many organizations, because um, Kevin and, and Jay are both responsible for that in, in Red Hat and Anthony and Amit are, have got similar um, remits in their respective organizations, ANZ and Optus. Um, so I guess as we all sort of sit here in our in our own houses and, and, and talk to the world. I might um, just start off with a question that anyone can feel free to jump into. Um, it's, it's, it's basically to, to idea about how transformative you think this COVID era is going to be when we reassess the changing way of work in the future, when we look back hopefully post COVID and, and look at this era, how transformative you think it's going to be. Um, maybe how it's changed the way you work personally um, with people both internally and externally and actually I will pick someone I'll pick on Anthony to get us going because it's a bit later in the morning in New Zealand there so he's more awake. Yeah, I should be more awake Come on, <laughs> yeah. closer to my coffee time. Yeah. Um, so I, it's interesting we, we've had this conversation actually on this very topic you know the question did it did it fundamentally change what we expected to happen in terms of the evolution of work or to just accelerate where you know what we thought would happen um 
and I think there's a bit where there's a bit of both because certainly in the way that, that our teams operate and the way our whole business operates, there's no question that it's really accelerated that sort of flexible working kind of mode, people being able to, to work differently uh, from whatever location, people reconsidering, you know, work-life balance and what their day actually looks like. Um, and all of those things have, have been things that we've long talked about and long talked about technology and working practices enabling but you would have to say that certainly in certainly in our organization there was but there was a slow progressive sort of role to that and really what's happened with COVID has just simply accelerated it um and and it's actually it's, it's made a bunch of us experts at things like that overnight um you know, we, we got i got some folks who are uh, who are just about YouTube streaming quality in terms of the way you, you feel quite daunted when you connect with them on their home setups. Yeah. What about you, Amit? Yeah, no, I think it's something which is going to be long lasting. It's not going to be a flickering effect, which we sort of went through and go back to the old ways and old practices. It's definitely had transformative effect on how we engage and how I engage with my team from how we used to do traditional one-on-ones, catch up with the team, catch up in the smaller or larger groups to, how do you communicate across uh, Zoom, across teams to a larger team, larger sort of cohort of people? That's been a big challenge and a big learning for a lot of us. As Anthony was mentioning, you have to hone up your skills in sort of communication, video presentation when you're talking across uh, like a broadcast type scenario as compared to sitting in a room where you can have a more interactive engagement uh, with staff and people. So this yeah. has definitely been a quite a big change for us. And, and I think it's, it's for, the be for the better. It's going to uh, stick around. It has had its benefit. We've been able to be more efficient. We've had, been, had opportunities to have better connections. Some areas have been more challenging than others in terms of brainstorming and the traditional sort of whiteboarding sessions that us engineer technical people are used to. We miss them. And technology hasn't been allowed us to have the same sort of response and interaction that we could have across a whiteboard and in a meeting room. But I think it's getting there. This is definitely going to be a transformative, transformative phase for us and around to stick around for much longer. Mm. Yeah, Kevin, you've got the sort of global view on, on this. I mean, what, what's what's your take? I mean, do you think we're um, around? <laughs> of course, Jabe does as well. You are to see that's a global view to me. But um, how, how do you think you, you obviously deal with a lot of clients? I mean, and, and you've been working in the field of transformation for, for a while. Is this the big transfer, transformative event of, of our generation? I think so. Um, I think that events like this... Um, force a lot of things to happen. And, um, you know, uh, in, in what can feel like unnatural ways, although this is actually very natural. Um, and, and so when we actually have to deal with new constraints or new problems or new things in front of us, um, you know, <laughs> humans get pretty good at figuring out how to get around things, how to, uh, you know, how to, to cope. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the, the larger picture of people trying to figure out what to do um, has actually gotten smaller in terms of uh, the, the, you know, what it is that they don't know right now. <laughs> like most companies are, are that we talk to are in a position where they don't have a lot of choices. They're apparent, very simple choices, get cash and figure out how to get to our customers again mm. and, and get, deliver some sort of value. And so as you've seen executives just really flock to get, um, you know, some sort of notion of liquidity in their organization so that they can make these new decisions and do these new things. Um, organizations have, uh, you know, unlike during normal times when transformation and, uh, you know, is much more of a thing that we get to choose. Right now, many of us are just having to deal with what is on a daily basis, and we're having to deal with a lot of uncertainty about what might be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But what needs to be done in the companies is not unclear. Um, there's a lot of things that were left undone that in the past maybe didn't get where they needed to be. And now the word that you're hearing in the States with organizations is hyper-transformation. It's literally paring down what we have to do and punching through the few things or the large things that we need to do to get where we should be to be able to, you know, actually work during these times. Mm. And, you know, a lot of laggard organizations that are, are, are still using the big T word to talk about where they're going to get eventually um, haven't had that choice right now. The eventual is now and the cash has got to be spent now and the people that they need to do the work have to be available now. It's it's tough. Yes, yeah, so, so I was just going to bring Jabin though as well. Do you sort of see this idea of um, 
survival versus actually planning what the best way to, to operate in the future is because obviously no one chose to suddenly have everyone forced to work at home but it's 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 offered this window into a different way of working um is it possible to try and pick the best of both environments what what are you what are you advising organizations to do in terms of trying to to cherry pick the best bits and 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 move forward once we can go back i i I like i like the question a lot because the, the, the thing that I think about right now is that I, have, I use this term all the time. It's called the being a grumpy optimist. So being grumpy optimist is being mad that you know things could be better than they are, but also being optimistic. Mm. And one of the things that I think that, that COVID is revealing right now in, in, in relation to transformation is uh, how incredibly adaptive people are at work. Like this seems like it should have been such a radical change. And yet most businesses, I mean, you know, they've been affected and certainly there's been change occurring, but most businesses haven't suddenly like dematerialized, collapsed, or, you know, (laughs) been incapable of functioning. Um, So like part of that means that that grumpy optimist should be the, that the optimism was justified that, that, that our organizations have a lot more adaptive capacity built into them than most people thought in the first place. Mm. And, and hopefully what will transform in the mind of managers in the future is, remember when we had that challenge, this challenge that we need to undergo right now doesn't seem as big as the COVID thing. We can probably get this done. And that's what I would like people to come away from this moment in history from is a grumpiness that things aren't as good as they should be, but an optimism that having gone through this really historical moment of challenge that our organizations were able to adapt to many of these challenges effectively. And, and, and therefore maybe we should all be reflecting on the ways in which our organizations have artificially limited the human uh, capabilities inside of them for a long period of time based on a set of beliefs that COVID is currently proving to be invalid, not true. We didn't need to be in the same room. We didn't need to have these meetings all the time in specific places and that we could effectively run companies in these in these novel ways that we're finding ways to do it right now and and that that should be a source of uh of invigoration as we come out of hopefully uh what we're experiencing right now yeah and and i guess this would be initially to anthony and amit um did the sort of arrival of of the covid pandemic because it did it sort of stop what you were working on before in terms of sort of business change transformation programs or did you just have this whole extra stuff put on your plate how have you carried on with you know essentially running hugely important businesses both of you in, t- in terms of critical infrastructure in, in different ways um how, how did you, how have you done that in terms of planning and maybe changing what you were doing as as things have progressed there's no question that um you know, the the event itself, particularly the lockdown activities, meant that um, you know, as an org, my organisation was very focused on how do we enable the business to operate remotely and make that transition. You know, what what are the things that we have at our disposal? Um, and certainly, you know, a lot of BCP scenarios often talk about well, you're going to revert from location A to location B, but when the whole country locks down, that's a different story altogether. Um, and it means that you're looking to have to scale, uh, you know, the way that you you provide remote working services to people in an in an exponential kind of way. And we were we were really fortunate in that we'd we'd done made some investments over the last few years that meant that we you know we needed to do a little bit of work, but we were able to partner to, to with a number of key organisations to actually achieve that outcome. And you know we we pushed out 900 odd um, contact centre folks uh, who are working remotely you know, within a matter of weeks, um, you know, the rest of the organisation was, and we had to manage capacity for the first few weeks. But by the time we got to about week three, it was pretty much BAU. We had a new sort of cadence, et cetera. And then really what's flipped is now the, how do we manage and how do we operate in this, in this kind of split mode? Um, you know, and there are actually, it's fascinating. There are some parts of our organisation, 
some of our software engineering uh, teams would say that they're more productive today than they uh, <laughs> than they were before um, because they don't have to keep sort of context switching and and there's not the same sort of cadence of you know regular meetings and things like we talked about. But but certainly what we've all done is learnt how to how do we engage, how do we understand what's going on, how do we prioritise uh, and develop a new sort of a cadence and, and way of engaging, um, you know, and rely a lot less on the uh, informal engagement and also uh, that we have to be much more intentional about um, connecting with each other and also really focusing on what it is that the teams are doing and really, really clear with our messaging because all our teams are balancing a lot of things, a, a lot on the home front, they're having to make adjustments the way they work. You know, they've often got, we've had kids out of school, a whole pile of things like that they've had to juggle. And so the way that we help with our part of that is to, you know, provide you with the right tools and also give you really clear messages about what's important and what should we be focused on. Um, and then and then really looking to, to help, you know, support that effort. Um, so that's, that's really been a, a transition that we've made and I think made it pretty successful. Yeah, I think Amish, if I just uh, turn to you then as well, obviously the focus very quickly turned to telecommunications infrastructure when all this started. And you would have had your own plans, you know, you're rolling out 5G and all this kind of stuff, all these things on the go already. But then suddenly we're talking to um, the government and saying, can we make Netflix lower the bit rate so yeah. that the telcos can can survive and, and everyone's going to need all this capacity. Businesses need it. They need it shifting. How have you kept on top of it all and planned the sort of distribution of your resources and what people are working on? Yeah, this was uh, quite a big challenge. Uh, and we had been on a digitization journey for quite some time. So we were preparing our internal systems and processes for being online and largely digital. But this threw a big curveball. As you mentioning, our big focus was 5G and mobility, pre pre providing access to people wherever they are, whether they're on the beach, in the park, in the shopping center. All of a sudden, lockdowns appear and no one's using the 5G mobile network and everybody's locked down in their homes. So we had mm -hmm. to pivot a whole bunch of capacity and resources to the fixed network to support people working from home, students studying at home, Netflix, gaming. There was massive spikes. We had 75% spike in Twitch, in, in streaming traffic from Zoom, 300% increase, Teams, MS Teams traffic increased 100% over, over the lockdown period, all on the fixed network all this latent capacity sitting on the mobile network that is sitting there waiting for people to come out of lockdown. So that required a lot of change on how we internally digested, how we internally hi highlighted issues, identified bottlenecks, what the customer's pains were, working with people proactively to make sure that they're getting the right experience, trying to prioritize video on demand versus connections to education sites. We worked with a lot of the schools in Victoria and New South Wales the education department to ensure that the right priority was being given to their traffic. And we were able to work with Netflix and YouTube and Google to make sure that the streaming quality can be reduced and so that it was an equitable sort of experience for everybody in the home rather than that contention across people using different apps applications. So there's a lot of rapid changes being thrown at us at, the, uh, at a regular interval and with a lot of pressure for our team internally to be able to cope with it and be able to provide the type of services and products which now we're sort of getting into steady stream. Mm, yeah, I guess um, at the, at the guys from Red Hat would be, uh, this, these challenges would be um, replicated all over the world and it's all these um, internal and external stakeholders when, when you when you, you talked about that you, and i guess you'd also be needing to keep a look on the various premiers news conferences every day to see which areas you're gonna um be changed which areas are locked down which areas are opened up so um i guess jay or kevin a company um how, how's it been handled uh, in clients that you're seeing and, and are the best practices that you're seeing about this sort of um chaos going around and all these multiple stakeholders about how you actually formulate a plan that you can work on for more than two days before it all changes again. Wow. I, I mean, I, I'll take a, a, a start here or a crack, but um, I think one of the problems that many companies have is, is that, uh, especially in the enterprise, um, is, is that they don't actually have a like single repository of all the work they're doing especially in technology. And so, and this is actually really a problematic thing in general because we keep making promises in technology and nobody knows about them. Um, every time we commit to do a thing, a project or whatever it is, it's a commitment and we have to keep a promise. And operations, I largely believe, is the act of keeping promises. Um, and so, you know, and that returns value. And, and so organizations that don't know what they're doing are really at a disadvantage right now because they can't shut down the things that they're doing to do the things they must do right now. And so one of the biggest things that we've found in, in organizations is the kind of the problematic 
uh, areas being exposed of how organizations don't really prioritize work correctly in many cases, or because they don't know about most of it. So a good example is, is if you talk to executives and you ask them how much work the technology organization is doing, all they know about is projects. 80% of the work in the technology organization is not projects. <laughs> It's operating. Just look at where the budget goes, except for right now, I mean, telcos are, are big, big, big spend on rollouts and, and, and new gear. But, but normally, uh, as it were, those things are budgeted and they happen fairly systemically, right? Except for when we have a new big uh, uh, thing, right? A new technology. So what, what I've seen is, is that these organizations that have a really bad handle on work in general, let alone new ways of working, because even then consider many of these organizations are in transformation, which means they're in some acquisition and understanding, right? Because organizations that are transformed are fundamentally not the thing they were before. And so people have to learn how to be in those organizations and that takes time. And one of the things I think we don't see is, is that managers don't, we expect them to know how to manage in a transformed organization that may be fundamentally different. And that may not be the case. So the slack that's required for learning that's normal in an organization, we don't budget already in many cases. Um, we just throw people to sharks um, and we call that a learning organization. Um, the good news is about that is, is that the organization knows about its work. It's just the leaders don't. So one of the problems I think we've had is, is everybody cleaning out their closets, you know, pulling out all the things we're doing. And some of those things are amazing, right? Some of those things people went, oh my gosh, does that work? We can do that? Give me 10 of those. Oh my gosh, right now, stop everything else you're doing, give me 10 of those, right? But very rarely is that the case. A lot of times we're finding out, hey, you know, yeah, oh yeah, that rollout of that new, you know, app that goes bing, we're not gonna do that anymore because we have to focus everything on changing our network quality of service priorities, which means not just the network people, it means actually figuring out what the company priorities are. You know, and we can actually then say what kind of traffic we want. So I think largely one of the things that's been really frustrating for a lot of companies is just, hey, what are we doing? And how do we stop it all? And how do we keep the things going that are still working? By the way, what's working? Like this is a problem with globally distributed organizations. We don't all share the same nervous system. And if we do, the network is our nervous system. Technology is the conduit that we use to communicate and anyway. So I think a lot of the problems I've been hearing people experience it sound things like when they're on a Zoom call, they're getting software rollouts that nobody wants or needs because they're normally happening at that hour. But normally they're not on Zoom at that hour, but they're talking to somebody in another place that they normally wouldn't be talking to. But technology has all of these things that are batch oriented and they can just continue to happen. Automation became one of the largest problems at one of our clients because it was doing all the wrong things. They didn't want it to do those things. And they realized, hey, wait a minute, this is a straitjacket. We have to fix this right away. We've got to turn that stuff off. Yeah. So not knowing what we're doing in many cases and not knowing how things get done at some level in these huge companies is, is, can be really problematic when you want to change the course really quickly. Mm, it's, it's fascinating that the idea of um, you actually doing too much um, at, at, the, at the same time. And so is it, I guess, Jabe, is this a, been an opportunity to be brutal about the things you didn't need to be doing anymore? And, and who <laughs> makes the call? Who makes the call? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, automation is literally the reproduction of the past in the future. That's what automation is, right? Like, and that's just me talking about my PhD, which happens to be in time. But literally, when you automate something, you re reproduce what you did in the past uh, frequently in the future. And that's great as long as the future is the same as the past. At moments right, like what we're experiencing right now, where there are radical disjunctions, there is the need to understand how to appropriately re-automate, what needs to be re-automated, how to rebalance things. Um, and, and there's a great paper called The Ironies of Automation, which discusses the problems of automation, which frankly have a lot to do with the fact that when you automate something, you often de-skill the workforce that normally would have done that work. So there's this, there's this balance point of, yes, absolutely you have to automate things away in order to reduce toil, uh, and the focusing on reducing toil, which is that work in which humans don't add a lot of value, uh, while 
opening space up for humans to add value into the work uh, and, and find more value. And that, that ability that I was talking about, that op reason for optimism, that human capacity for adaptation is great for applying to those tasks that don't automate particularly well and keep the automation isolated away to things that humans do not very well and need help reproducing. And then the trick is noticing things changing and things like that. But one of the things I'd also point out, like one of the things I think that uh, Kevin and I would think a lot about and maybe share with Amit is there's, there's, this, uh, there's a great book by Amy Edmondson and it's called Teaming. And, and the basic theory of mm. teaming in the book is this observation that like, if you go to an emergency room, like there is no norming, storming, forming politics version of an emergency room. When someone comes in with a gunshot, a team emerges from the room around that person and they stay with that person until the, they are stabilized, right? Uh, what we're experiencing right now is exactly those types of things. The crisis itself becomes such a motivating factor in the organi organization of the teams and the focus of the teams that things like needing to have a strategy and explain clearly what needs to be done next because what needs to be done next extends out a long period of time. None of that's true right now, or at least for the last six months, most of it has been emergent problems in operations. That's what we've been needing to solve for, right? We need to figure out how to operate in this new environment. Now, that, uh, that reason for optimism around kind of being able to operate through this stuff and being able to adapt to it quickly the trick, I think, is to then take that, what we've learned from doing that operational um, triage, that operational reconfiguration, and apply it towards strategies themselves. So that what we get is a much more fluid relationship, not just with what we used to do, that's the operational aspects, but what might we, what might we do next? Could we use these same ways of organizing ourselves, those same ways of communicating, to instead of making very long-term commitments, make more intermediate commitments with much more frequent reevaluation of, is this where we really wanna be? Is this where we really wanna go? So that we can start bending the curve of the organizations as opposed to declaring strategies that frankly, frequently don't ever play out very well. So I, I think like the balance between there is, is, is an interesting thing to talk about and, and the idea of what lessons can we take from now and what should we apply them to next is something yeah. I would. Yeah, I, sh I should mention as well, um, um, Aditya uh, on the Q&A panel has already asked a really interesting question. I am keeping an eye on that. I won't, um, I won't ignore it. So um, please uh, keep putting your questions in there. I'll come back to, to Aditya's question in a minute because it's a really good one. But I just wanted to bring Anthony in, um, in on that because Jabe obviously brought up the subject of automation and, and certainly with ANZ, I remember writing a few years ago about um, the sort of development of RPA within um, ANZ and, and if they were sort of trying it out um, earlier than some other banks. And I'm just um, curious as to what this era, this era has done in terms of the, the focus on, on automation for the future, will it increase? And are you getting much more comfortable in how to successfully deploy it um, and, and make the best use of it rather than just the sort of um, almost basic idea of, oh, it's going to replace um, boring processes? Are you getting more sophisticated in how you develop it? Yeah, certainly. I mean, RPA was kind of like the version 1.0 and some some people would call it like poor man's integration as well and a, and a few a few things like that um but but i guess for us it's really been interesting if we take from a from an operational kind of perspective for us um you know one of the things that that we that you often see is that people like to talk about automation um and then the level of guidance they give the organization is now go go and automate you know it's not a uh, you know yeah you know, it's, it's a it's a magic sprinkling of automation dust that we spread around the organization and and the reality is as our learning is is that you really have to be really quite intentional about that and so what we did is we actually set up a, an automation coach a, a role within our organization and they've got a, a team now and their whole role and function is a couple of things. We, we build a, I like to mention a toil, we build a toil framework that we rolled out across the organization. And that was a really a great opportunity to get buy-in from our teams so that they could identify that 
here's an here's a piece of toil that I think needs some focus or some work that would actually enable us to extract ourselves out of that so we can focus on more value added tasks. And so what we what we've got is essentially then that's gone and built a backlog because it enables us to prioritize what's the what's the most impactful thing that we could go and automate and focus on that and then actually go and drill into that. And then we have an automation coach and a, and a team that goes with that that actually helps our engineering teams actually understand the technologies, different approaches and methods that they can apply to automate. And so I think by, by taking that approach and have being a bit more structured in the way that we captured the opportunity, the way that we had a program around it, it's allowed us to really mature the way that we use automation in the organization. Um, so, uh, so and we're, we're, we're definitely continuing down that path and, and uh, a shameless plug here, I'm actually hiring at the moment in my automation team. So any experts out there, give me a, give me a call. Good stuff. Um, Amit, have, have, have you been um, doing much of this uh, at Optus? Yeah, it, the, the biggest focus for us during this sort of lockdown period has been in the operations teams. Mm. Um, just basically to allowing us to give us that agility to react to what the customers are wanting with the changes in lockdown, changes in traffic patterns, changes in demand. Previously, our, uh, operations automation was a target for us. There was always this intention to go self-healing network, uh, automatic uh, trick ticket resolution. We had to accelerate a lot of that. Uh, there were also uh, scenarios where some of our outsourced partners and countries were locked down. So we would lost a lot of our resources hand and feet toward keeping eyes and ears on the network suddenly they were not able to do that. So that accelerated that whole requirement for us to automate uh, the operations part of the network. Mm. We have gone through down through that path as well as saying, getting a lot of agile scrum set up, getting a lot of uh, uh, mentors set up across the, across the different departments whose sole task is to identify what the root cause is, look at whether it's a process issue or a technical issue, rather than jumping head first into the problem and trying to find, solve it, sit back, and analyze it, and see what's the best uh, route uh, to resolving it, whether that's in, it's a management issue between different teams or whether it's a technical issue or whether it's a more complex solution that needs, that, that needs resolution. So we've had a lot of focus on it and thankfully we're getting a lot of good success now working with a lot of our partners and improving how we automate a lot of the operational activities in our network. So I mean, where you were um, dealing with sort of external um, service providers, you mentioned that went into lockdown mm -hmm. and you've now essentially automated what they were doing, will you then, keep doing what you're doing now or have, have, have they sort of proven themselves not needed anymore how, how what happens post lockdown yeah that's that's an interesting question because we've uh, we have we were forced to be self-resilient we managed to find solutions that were, uh, allowed us to get out of that little hole that we had for a while uh, but but i think what we did end up doing was a lot of tactical solutions that were deployed at the time and um, now we're going through the evaluation process whether some of these tactical solutions can become strategic solutions in the long run and we're working with our outsourced partners as well to say, look, this was uh, a change in uh, environment and how we're operating. Let's look at the benefits that we have learned from this. Let's, uh, let's take the learnings and see how we can put that towards uh, the future. So there's a lot of discussions going on with our outsourced partners to see what is the optimal model now. Maybe mm. the optimal model isn't to outsource somewhere where you get cheaper resource base. Maybe we need to focus more on uh, uh, accelerating some of our automation, machine learning, AI-based solutions where we can get better insights into the network, react faster. And mm. we have valid use cases now as well to be able to deploy some of them. Yeah, I might just go to the, what the question from the audience, one of the questions from the audience here, because uh, it refers back to what we were talking about a little bit ago, and I think it's it's worth opening it up so you can give you answers to it. And I'll read it out for the people watching the recording after the event so they don't see this. It's, um, in our organisation, we feel that distributed working has actually made the team much more efficient with a lot of operational day-to-day -day work. But the collaboration to tackle a complex, difficult task like a new architectural design is a lot more difficult. For example, things that you would traditionally do on a day long whiteboard session or a technology offsite. Have any of you faced that and found a way to make that process more effective? Yeah, we certainly what, what we found useful is actually trying to, you know, break a problem up. And you're right, having that, you know, spending a whole day sort of trying to simulate that whiteboard you know, gathering around the right whiteboard situation is it's, it's really hard to replicate, you know, virtually. And so what we tend to do is divide it up into, into sort of chunks or stages. Um, and, and we found that actually a, a, an effective sort of way of sort of trying to achieve the same kind of outcome. Um, and, uh, and it also lets people sort of, but the interesting thing is that 
um, it lets people consider and do some more research in between some of those little iterations. Uh, and that's actually been really quite, quite useful. It'll also bring in other views where you can't, you don't have the person available real time, but it's like, oh, for this next bit, this person would have the right expertise. Let's bring them in for this segment. And so what we found is actually breaking the problem down that way has actually been kind of useful. So, um, so that's kind of how we've, how we've worked our way around that. Yeah, similarly for us, uh, getting away from the traditional meeting room with 20 people sitting there, we found that it was more productive when we chunk it down to smaller areas to get a focus area, SMEs in particular, area focused on a problem, do a whiteboard session, and then bring people in as they needed. It allows people the flexibility to digest what's been discussed, go do some research and join and collaborate. So it's a different way of working. That's it's true. definitely, I would say, getting takes getting used to, uh, but we are finding ways to make it work. Yeah, Kevin, I think you wanted to come on that to you. Yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> it's interesting is I've been watching different sectors deal with this completely differently. So what you'll find is um, some places have gotten worse uh, in terms of interruptions, in terms of the kinds of things that are bothering people. I've, I've seen organizations that literally remain on Zoom all day in the chats and um, um, and are basically causing that problem we used to all have back when we were on AOL Messenger and we couldn't get anything done because, you know, 96 of our friends were making things bing, bing. And and so we literally are finding that, you know, some of these people are turning them off. But on, on the whole, what I'm finding is, you know, I think people are having a lot more time to be thoughtful. Um, and I think, you know, I am really glad that um, we are seeing a large disapproval of this kind of still lingering uh, bull crap that executives believe about people being lazy in their homes. You know, that old Taylor idea that people walk home from work faster than they walk to work. Um, never mind that their families are at home and their families aren't at work. And, the, you know, the, the, the notion is that um, people were going to be lazy left unseen. And I think right now the digital generations have, you know, basically <laughs> uh, X and beyond have basically proven that wrong. And something that I think our generations have been saying to business for going on 30 years now has been proven right. And not only proven right, but in many cases, these are some of the new capabilities we needed to go to the next level. And, and so whether we actually have a reality that's more like this than it was, or some sort of in between, um, I think that for the notion of lazy employees at home has been broken, which is nice, because I'll tell you what, work-life balance needs to change for people in tech. And we are the last recipients of the benefits of the digital world for some reason, in many cases, in terms of our own lives. And right now, if you look at our industry, it's not sustainable what we're doing in the past here. We're just losing too many people. And one of the problems that happened when we moved everybody home is, is you think sysadmin stayed up a lot already? This basically normalized what they do as a coping mechanism. And basically, now there is no on call. There is, when are you not on call? <laughs> right? Yeah. And so it, it varies in organizations. And organizations that have nice field service or are used to providing a lot of customer service have ways to balance and rotate that and, and minimize the impacts. But, you know, like Amit was saying, if your region is shut down, you don't have any people in it. So, you know, that means somebody else has to pick up the slack. And, and if it's not automation, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, I think a lot of us, um, you know, are reviewing, like, you know, it was really, it was really interesting to hear him talking about just like the notion of reviewing how sourcing is working. Because in many cases, in my experience, we've used sourcing to take level one tasks away, level two tasks. And as we've gotten better at sourcing, we've essentially built a framework of automation for another organization to do the things. And so taking that, those additional steps is hard, but is becoming increasingly apparent that for our reliability and keeping our promises, we need to do those things. And so now having people that can peel off, not be in all of the other din and all of the other kind of chaos of the, of the water cooler traffic, the drive-by shooting tasks that people come by your cubicle with, all of that stuff is changing. Right. And so I think what we are maybe realizing is, is not everything about corporate environments open floor plans, all those wonderful things made any sense. Like when we look at our productivity on core issues right now, I think we're going to find that the things we needed to get done, we got done. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's going to, we're going to have to sit back and eat a bunch of crow 
about all of the things that we said we must have in order to do work. Turns out a lot of those are like to haves. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what does this do to the future of, sort of executive manager? Um, do you think? Because I mean, we, we've spoken a lot about the increasing autonomy, intelligence of people um, being self-starters and working and getting done what needs done. Um, but when you talk about broader organizational transformation, you're often asking the executives that were in charge to change the systems that they were responsible for and they were experts for. Um, how do you say, I guess I'll go to Jade first. Um, you've been writing about sort of transformation organization wide. Um, what does this do to the future of leadership and, and the notion that people in charge are changing things that gives them less control and maybe makes them less important? Yep. Uh, so uh, one of the things I think is uh, to, to really quickly mention is that one of the things we're seeing right now is kind of a compression in, in, in with the entire organization's organizing itself around quite critical crisis moments, right? So everything's kind of compressed and small. And then in normal times, in, in times when we don't have an, an emergent or immediate crisis, most organizations actually organize themselves across several, several different time spans. And like the really quick version of time spans would be like, you've got tactical time spans of development and operations. You've got strategic time spans that include things like product management or architecture. Yeah. And then you've got long-term time spans that have to do with leadership. And th these time spans are subtly different in different organizations. The top can get any anywhere from like 20 years to five years, depending on what industry you're in. And the middle can also kind of flex a little bit based on that. Usually there's a relationship between the two. But in software engineering, it's pretty easy right now. The tactical people operate in a two-week time cycle. The strategic people operate in about a year to a year and a half cycle. And in the best organizations that we see, we see like a leadership operating in a three or four-year cycle, right? Now, the important thing to recognize is kind of everybody knows what the Dilbert principle is. Like you get promoted to the level in which you don't function anymore. And then the next step is to go down one level and operate at that level, but wider, right? right. Same thing right. happens in these temporal time spans. As people get promoted up, the minute that they can no longer function, they can't think at these longer time scales, they tend to go back down and try to ma micromanage people at the, at the shorter time spans. And one of the really simple things to think about there is just that uh, if you want to tell a story about what you're doing for the next two weeks, because you're a scrum team and someone else shows up and says, I'm the manager, I, I get to tell the story of what you're doing for the next two weeks. It's kind of like, I don't feel like I have a lot of legitimacy at work and I don't get to tell my narrative very well. On the other hand, if that person shows up and says, this is what we need to achieve over the next six months. And you say, this is what I'm going to do for the next two weeks. And you compare those two stories and go, this is what I'm going to do for the next two weeks. I'm going to achieve what we need to do for the next six months. That, that's a narrative discussion about how to link two kind of layers together. And then you can have the same thing between um, the middle managers and the executives, right? And so this is a very long way of saying, in normal times, my experience working with executives is that if you walk into most executives and talk to them about what is it you're trying to do, and you've talked to enough of them, most of what they say makes sense. Like it's like well thought through, they've hired a bunch of consultants to, to help them think about it. It's not stupid, it's completely reasonable. And then you go down to the teams and you say, what do you think about what they think up there? And they go, I have no idea what that has to do with my life or anything I'm doing right now. I don't know why they're asking me to do any of that stuff. It doesn't make any sense at all, right? And so why we're so productive during a crisis is because we've aligned on all short-term frames. But as the frames start expanding again, this crisis of the lack of an effective middle management narrative is, is what we need to solve for. And that means that things like architecture and product management will become important as a way of keeping alignment between the executive and the, the tactical layer, right? Yeah. Uh, and that means, you know, again, that middle management is where strategy is thought of and occurs. Executives are the people who provide the capabilities to create the strategies. They aren't the people who, act, who define the strategies. That's, that's too small of a role for executives. Executives need to be thinking of, I need to maximize the amount of valid possible strategies that could be deployed in the marketplace. That's my job. 
Their job is to define what the actual strategy is. So roughly saying, as we kind of move out of this transition uh, that we're going through right now, and the time span, like the amount of time between now and the next crisis goes from like, in the next 10 minutes, there'll be another crisis to, you know, that we have some breathing space. The narratives and the things that we need to develop inside of our organizations is an alignment between these three levels and a real way of thinking through those things and making sure that people show up to work every day and can not only tell their own stories about what they're doing at work, but align those stories with broader narratives that are occurring in strategy and in management. And that, that I think is the challenge coming out of this and making sure that we can kind of maintain this, uh, this hopeful grumpiness that I was pointing at and that Kevin was also kind of talking about that, that we can do this work. Yeah, I mean, one just one interesting thing to, to kind of counterpoint, or well, not even counterpoint, what Jay was talking about, build on. One of the things that we're doing right now uh, in a lot of companies um, is following a pattern um, that is actually in training some of our brilliant people into two-week time cycles. So whenever we talk about Scrum, I'm going to be actually a little bit uh, heretical here and challenge most folks and say, hey, listen, if you've got folks in architecture, you've got folks that actually need to, in product management and they need to have longer views, consider removing them from two week intervals as the only thing that they actually operate in. It is terrible for architecture long term. You start to get things like emergent architecture because we didn't think of it in a two week cycle. You start to get a lot of things that don't uh, lengthen the organizational attention span. And, and so what I would actually, what we consider is, is Scrum is great training wheels, but at the end of the day, your organization cares about flow and building organizational flow. And that does not operate two weeks at a time. That is all year, all the time. And so what we actually have to do is get good at what are we not going to do? What are we going to do? Scrum gives us that nice cheat hack of blocking everything else out. And it should tell us a, while, a lot about why we don't get anything done in the enterprise. That's if we can't operate that way all the time with everybody, right? So when we think about systematic ways of working, it's fine if some of us do operate at that, right? I have operators that I've had work for me in the past that literally need to be told every day what to do. And that's okay. That's fine. They do it and they do it perfectly. We all have different time horizons, but when we want to learn, we need to think about stretching them. And learning how to tell stories that go longer than two weeks, hanging around people that tell stories that are longer, encouraging those people to tell longer stories is huge. So that we see them retreating back into the story, down into just their little piece, their little card on the Kanban, <laughs> we're not doing the organization a service. I was, I was gonna say internally at ANZ then, Anthony, how are you tracking performance? Are, are you... Um... Are you tracking performance in the same way that you would have done traditionally? You think it's changed in the way that um, with with not everyone there. I mean, and I guess at, at times that there's a question on that on their Q and A as well, which relates to tracking the performance of automation from a guy called Ryan Ryan Both. So thanks for that question. Um, how you track the performance of automation as it's ongoing as well. So it's like kind of amalgamating those two loosely related questions and saying, "I'm first to Anthony." How how are you going with that? So, so certainly, I mean, performance is important at, at any time. Um, so we're, we're certainly, we've been actually in the process of re, you know, re, uh, I guess, issuing our performance framework, the way that we, you know, measure, measure performance, reward folks, et cetera. Um, you know, but, but I think the key thing there uh, has been around really providing that absolute clarity about just focus on these things. Um, and, and I think, you know, I take, you know, Kevin's point in that, that, that broader narrative about what's the why behind the what that I've asked you to do is really that context becomes really important. Um, and so that's certainly, you know, it's got to be part of that dialogue and conversation. But for us, really, that that performance measure piece, that doesn't go away. You know, we're about to go into a cycle of doing our annual performance reviews. We, you know, we've, we've our, our talent and culture team have done a great job in sort of providing our, our managers with some a different guidance about, you know, how might you go about doing this remotely, et cetera, and those kind of things. And that, and that guidance has been ongoing from, for a while now, just to making sure that the people are still thinking about, you know, actually looking after their people, giving that feedback about, you know, here's how you're going. And this is, this is, this is what we're working on together. And, 
and and that's something that that doesn't go away um and so we're continuing to to do that and we'll do it remotely and we'll go through our it'll be different this time around but um but i think it'll still it'll still play out the way it plays out and and uh, i think there's good maturity around that in terms of performance of automation um i guess for us the 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 key thing there is that um you know that we're actually feel like that we're focused on the automating the right things for, for us is probably the the bigger measure i mean yes there's the auto the operational measurement did the automation occur etc and making sure that it didn't it didn't cause untoward consequences and those kind of pieces but that's just more operational discipline but for us it becomes very much about you know yes you could try and automate everything but that's not particularly useful so how do we how do we help teams decide what's the right thing to automate um and that's really where you know where we really look at it from a system perspective uh, are we achieving the right outcomes of that you know we we're, we're focused for example a whole lot at the moment around um we've got a whole lot of product compliance checking that we need to do across you know thousands of devices across our network um you know and and that's a that's a classic automation sort of use case um and it removes a whole pile of toil from our teams and it also plays into giving us a much clearer stance on our you know risk and security posture in that we're confident about you know what's the configuration compliance of our fleet and so that's a great example where that's absolutely the right thing for us to be focused on it went through a process and we feel good about that as an outcome so i guess that's probably how i'd assess the performance of automation if we were talking about from that perspective i mean what do you think i mean are you um are you well without you're not going to say no but are you able to keep track of everything that needs to um to be to be happening right now but also uh, as jabe was talking about um what you should, oh, sorry kevin was talking about what should be doing over the next six to 12 months how how are you how are you handling that and and how are you monitoring what's actually going on as you speak when you you know you sat at home in your kitchen yeah, it's it's this this scenario that we are on, uh, under at the moment has actually been a positive one from that perspective. Mm. Uh, with a lot of collaboration tools that we've sort of thrust on the people that they're using now in online channels, Confluence, Jira, it's possible for the managers, the middle managers and, and senior managers, to be a lot more across what the teams are doing, what's happening uh, down on the on the on the field. Previously, we were a bit disconnected. You would have to have those regular sort of steering meetings or regular catch-ups to find out how the projects are performing, how the developments were going, how the various initiatives were performing. But now with these sort of collaboration tools, it's possible to get snapshots. So you go to dashboards and you can, whenever you're free, you're going for a walk, you can just uh, pop in and have a look at those uh, dashboards on, on Confluence. So it has been positive from that perspective that we, I feel I'm more connected in terms of with what the various teams are doing and how they're performing, what their struggles are, what the challenges are. Um, in terms of, I guess, um, how we gauge automation success, um, as Anthony was saying, with this myriad of sort of analysis tools that we use in terms of what the financial payback was, how much uh, of a benefit we got in terms of reduction in errors being done and compliance improvements and security improvements. Um, but that has also meant that we've also had to be pretty choosy in terms of which ones we go forth with. Not every single thing needs to be automated. There are benefits in automating particular aspects of it when it gives you a long-term benefit, but there are also other solutions as well. So we do spend a lot of time, a lot of discussion in going through our automation hopper to see what needs to be automated and what maybe we need we can have alternate options to resolve those issues so yeah. that has been one of the main sort of learnings previously when automation was quite the hype around in our organization everybody was jumping on it everything was being automated and that led to a myriad of different solutions maybe the different tools which were disconnected and we were having problems in who looks after the automations once it's developed it works, but then over time, it needs that help, that care, that, that looking after to make sure that it continues to develop. There might be security and patching, patches that need to be updated, new compliance requirements that need to be retrofitted. That was always a gap. So now we're being much more careful in making that decision. Automate, yes, but automation, it has to be signed off across the organization. I was I was just looking at the at the corner of our screen here and see that as as always happens with these things the clock tends to tends to beat the best intentions and, and pages full of questions still unanswered and lovely questions from some of the audience that I haven't got to and I apologise to the people who have not got to your question I just wanted to ask a last question before we we wrap up and 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 go about our, our day or evening for Jabe and Kevin it's um uh, it's just something that interests me and it kind of ties into what we've been talking about is when such if lockdowns come to an end and it becomes more of a choice about where we want to work again and how we want to operate um what do you intend to do um, and what do you think most leaders in the tech space will do and i think I'll, I'll go first to 
Amit, then Anthony, and then Jay, and then Kevin, and we'll we'll wrap up after that. So Amit, let, let's go. Let's go to you first. What what do you intend to do, and what do you think others are going to do? Um, I think we'll embrace a lot of the changes that we made within the organizations, particularly as you mentioned around sourcing decisions that we used to make and how uh, those sourcing decisions were made. These learnings that we've had over the past few months are going to be a, a important factor for us to consider. Um, a lot of the organizations are probably being a similar path, I think. I'll be surprised if any organization really reverts back to the bad old days of 2019. I think this is going to be something that's going yeah. to be set in there and it'll, st it'll be sticky. I, 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 yeah. I'm surprised if we go back. Yeah. What, 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 what are your thoughts on how, how things are going to change for you and, and what, what do you think you'll do differently when, well, things are closer to normal in New Zealand, of course. Yeah, they're a bit closer to normal, although we're still, still in a level of lockdown. I mean, I think we've, we've taken some steps to really embrace, you know, this new way of working. We've given up floors in buildings and things like that. Um, you know, move to complete hot desks, environments, um, all, all of those things that, that I guess have just accelerated, like I said at the start, you know, what we had intentionally in mind anyway. Um, but we're certainly seeing also people uh, and teams themselves kind of really step change in the way that they interact with each other. You know, my, my team tends to congregate on Wednesdays and Thursdays when we're in the office. Those are the days that we, you know, that we tend to always, you know, make that commitment to each other that we'll be there in person. And the balance of the time is kind of flexible based on your own schedule and what you need. And so that's that's kind of how we've morphed into working as a team and that works for us. And, and it really also, I think it extends that conversation about how, what does work for you collectively as a team? Because in the past, there's a lot of conversations you didn't have was like, where are you going to be? Well, of course you'll be here. You'll be here in the office, won't you? Or, or occasionally you'd be traveling, et cetera. But you know now we, we, we're we're much more connected and in tune with what each other needs, you know, from a personal schedule, how they like to interact, and those kind of things. And that's been, you know, brings a an actually a, a level of richness to the conversation you have about how do you really want to work as a team, you know, what really works for people individually. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's what people enjoy. That's what they expect, and I expect to see it to continue. Okay, we'll move to you. So uh, you know, I. My comment would be, I think that like velocity of change and amount of change is norm has been since, you know, for the last 10 years, uh, something mostly of choice. You, you got to choose how much change you wanted in your organization. And one of the things we're experiencing right now is mm, a, yeah. an amount of change that is not one that the organization gets to choose. And out of that, I think that most organizations are going to realize two things that they need to focus on. One is, I mean, when we heard Amit kind of discussing kind of agility entering operations, right? So uh, agility isn't just something that occurs in development. It's also something that occurs in operations. So that's, that's an important moment to notice that kind of the DevOps has fully across the chasm is now part of you have to be able to do this otherwise you can't be functional um and because of that realization what i think a lot of organizations are going to realize is what li what's limiting their devops is their architecture whether or not they have a architecture capable of supporting the volume of change required to survive these turbulent uh, moments in history. So that's the first change. And the second one is that almost every single organization that I've seen that's gone through a successful kind of DevOps adoption, and that can include things like platforming, automation, et cetera, eventually realizes that governance becomes a major bottleneck um, and compliance in relationship to government. So, you know, governance risk and compliance, GC GRC, um, and therefore, um, uh, there's going to be a significant focus in the next five years on automated governance. So taking the ideas of automation and not just applying them to rote manual work for like recreating a server or reproducing an environment, but for actually recording all the added stations in an objective way uh, so that people can replay uh, the attestations and know how the current environment that is operating was created and be able to go to a, a compliance officer and assert that they know exactly how what was currently running was created and that there's no uh, manual or object uh, of su or subjective attestations in that chain. That 
alone significantly and radically changes the game. And the organizations that we've seen, and there's only a few, but the organizations that we've seen who have adopted a focus on architecture and a focus on automated governance um, are seeing really uh, significant value out of those two investments right now, especially in the crisis. So that's what I would think we're going to see. And, and so to wrap things up, thank you, Jay. That was a great answer. And we'll just move finally to, to Kevin for, for your thoughts. So uh, I think of two things that have changed forever. One is, is legitimacy-based transformations that are self-scored, right? So we, we, at the end of the day, all of our executives that get to talk to the street about their transformative efforts at this point and what it's going to bring to, in many cases, just to get legitimacy, quite frankly, at this point, <laughs> um, you don't get to score that anymore. You don't get to declare a victory at the end of your transformation because you say so. Right now, it's basically how digital are you is how well are you doing? In other words, how native is this stuff in your organization? How quickly did it take hold? What do you have to stand on right now? Right? There's no more just talking, talk, talk, talk about all of our capabilities as a company and on the, you know, to, the, to Wall Street anymore. It's literally, are you processing orders? Are you communicating? Are you, are you alive? Right? And so this has definitely changed the yardstick for transformation, right? Um, and taken it out of the pie in the sky consultant stuff and actually turned it into something that's a proof of life. Right. The second thing is, is communications patterns have been permanently altered in companies. Right now, what we're seeing is the way we're communicating. We all love to talk about how we're on Zoom. We have the kids, blah, blah, blah. But what's happening is direct paths of communication are being established to get things done. The um, kind of unseen deer paths of processes, the way things actually get done not the way that they're supposed to get done, those are changing really quickly because it's not sustainable in many cases for people to do those things the way they used to. I can't go over to Jan's desk and buy her a cup of coffee and then she does that thing where all my expenses disappear. That's just not working anymore because Jan already has a cup of coffee because she's at home and she doesn't need to hear from me about something I should do because I'm at home, right? And so what's happening is interesting. There's, that's a, a really small example, but teams are figuring out how to be more self-sufficient. Individuals are being, figuring out how to be more self-sufficient. The kind of burn of needing to be connected that we feel sometimes at home is translating into how do I get things done when I can't be connected? So we're starting to think a little differently about work. And it's very subtle, but it's moving very quickly. And I think it's if we go back to offices in the same way, which I think a lot of companies, you know, large insurance companies that are running the actuarials on this stuff are not returning to offices in the States in many cases. They've just sold off a ton of their real estate. And I was like, don't laugh at them, right? They're the most conservative people there are, right? They're doing this based on actual data. And so these paths that we once had, literally walking around offices, stopping at people's desks, meeting in the cafeteria, all these things that we love to say were the DNA of our company, they may not continue to be the DNA of our company. If we start to get together, we'll do those things naturally, we're human. But what I'm seeing now is different patterns, different efficacy, different goal, and a lot more focus on getting it done, staying engaged, keeping my job, keeping my company going. We're all taking this a lot more seriously right now. And, and I think that will change things forever. I think it's gonna change our next group of leaders. We're gonna have leaders that come up in the middle of this. We can't put off promoting people. We have to do it, right? People are going to come up in COVID. This is gonna be that thing like, no, it wasn't Vietnam, but I served back in COVID, right? People are gonna say this right now. And it's crazy to think about it, but we've lost more life, our country has, that way. And so it's a big experience. And, and so I know that for my family, Vietnam was a very defining and changing experience for generations. Um, and I know that COVID is going to do that, um, you know, in, in the way we work, the kind of connections we have. And really at the end of the day, our sign of legitimacy is staying afloat. Our sign our, you know, is, is, is actually not only just being able to stay afloat, but actually being able to do that and help some other, other 
organization, so somebody else, right? I think that expectation has changed. It's not enough just to exist. Exist, tread water, do what you got to do, but you better, better, better hand somebody else a life raft, a life preserver, or put an arm around them if you can. That's, That's different. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. That's a wonderful way to, to, wrap, to wrap it all up. And I'd just like to thank you all for the conversation. I've really enjoyed it. It's a lovely way to spend an hour. And then hand over to um, Tanya, the, um, the, the boss from the Trans Tasman Business Circle, to, to bring things to, to an end and, and, and say a few things. So thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Oh, my God. Now, that was a big experience. What an amazing session. Thank you so much for being with us, Jabe, Kevin. Anthony, and of course, Amit, and expertly, always expertly done by Paul Smith. Uh, we can't thank you enough, and we can't thank Red Hat enough for bringing such unbelievable thought leadership to our platform. I mean, we've already get, had so much positive response coming up on the chat saying, what an excellent session. You guys are amazing. You're at the front line. You're taking one for many teams. You, you're the ones who aren't sleeping, and we know that the human toll is taking its, its, um, its toll. The, 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 this this whole piece of you know you in in all of this and mm. and we feel it and we know we know what you guys are going through um and um that you could share so openly with our audience is amazing so thank you so much for that um we could have gone on for ages so here's the poll so please if you could all fill that in and then uh, the poll results will come up i just want to thank you again for being with us trusting us and uh, we hope you've enjoyed today. The poll results will come up and there they are. So I don't need to actually go through them because we have run out of time because we went so well, but the most important one is did this meeting, this briefing meet your objectives 100%. Guys, you nailed it. Thank you for being with us. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And we'll see you again at the circle. Bye. Thank you very much.